Welcome to our senior portfolio reading, Telling Secrets to the Trees, an SMSU's 12th annual undergraduate research conference. And thank you for joining us today, faculty, staff, students, administrators, relatives, and friends. I am Marianne Murphy Zarzana, Associate Professor of English and Director of the SMSU Creative Writing Program. First, we extend our thanks to Dr. Emily Deaver, who initiated the Undergraduate Research Conference in fall 2006 and has organized it every year since then. We appreciate this opportunity to include our senior portfolio reading as part of this stellar campus event. Second, thank you to Dr. Neil Smith, Chair of the English, Philosophy, Spanish, and Humanities Department for his leadership and to all my colleagues in the department the faculty who have challenged and nurtured our student writers. It's an honor to serve with such outstanding professors. Thanks to Leanne Teig, our administrative assistant who keeps our department on track. And thanks to Laura Botine, building services manager, and her staff for all their work today and every day. Thank you to Marcy Olson, publications editor, for her help with the reading poster. And thanks to Stu Gallstad, electronics technician for recording today's reading. Finally, congratulations to our three senior creative writing students who will be reading today, Brittany Branch, Kaylee Farley, and Alexandra Crone, for their hard work, courage, and dedication to the craft of writing. In their writing, they take on challenging themes and handle them with depth and insight, using the writing skills they have honed over the past four years here at SMSU. As a graduation requirement, all SMSU creative writing students produce a senior portfolio of their best work and present their work at a senior portfolio reading. Today, each writer will read for about 15 minutes. They will introduce each other. Please hold your applause until the end of each student's reading. Now please take a moment to silence your electronic devices. Thank you. I'd also like to remind our students that the Leo Dangle Creative Writing and Literature Scholarship deadline is tomorrow, Thursday, November 30th, on Academic Works Online. Hi, my name is Brittany Branch. I will be introducing Alexandra Crone. She is from Viking, Minnesota, and is in English and creative writing, as well as a hospitality management concentrations in culinary and event planning major. She has been writing since she was 12 and is a super senior. I met her my freshman year, and we've had a few workshop classes together. Last spring, she took an online course through Normandale Community College with three other SMSU students that then culminated in a trip to Iceland. This is Alexandra Krohn. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. Uh, so I will be reading three things. Uh, the first will be a poem titled Fortress, then a fiction piece, a silent alarm, and lastly, a nonfiction essay, The Other Side of the Glass. <clears throat> Fortress. Afternoons, we'd sneak outside to get away from Grandma's prying eyes. We shut the screen door gently to not make a sound. We ran for cover across the coulee, balanced on the fallen oak, smirked at each other as we make our escape. We crawled under the barbed wire fence, followed the warm terrain. We get to the big pine, then rest, raced the rest of the way. We reached the wooden fort made the summer before. Fallen branches strung together with twine. We wanted a place just for us to come and go as we pleased. A place to be princesses taken by the evil witch. We waited for Prince Charming to come rescue us until we got bored and found something else to do. Grandma always found us, dragged us back with a frown, but we all knew that we'd sneak up the next day and the next. The next is Silent Alarm. The smell of gasoline and asphalt assault Marnie when the elevator doors open. A cold breeze blew the snow from outside into the open parking garage. 
She wraps her gray cardigan tighter around her and moves her hands up and down her arms, trying to ward off the cold. Why didn't I grab my coat? She pulls a keychain out of her bag and holds onto the small pepper spray on the ring. The click of her heels echo in the nearly empty parking lot as she makes her way to her car. She notices a white van one parking space away on the driver's side of Marnie's car. She looks around the dimly lit parking garage and tries to peer into the tinted windows. Marnie walks cautiously, not turning her back to the van. Her hands shake as she looks down for a moment to find her car key. I'm never taking a night shift ever again. She finds the right key, but it slips from her grasp when she goes to unlock the car. She snatches the keys up off the ground and tries to ignore the pounding of her heart. Her hands shake as she tries to insert the key to unlock the door. Just get in the car. She uses her other hand to steady herself and opens the door wide enough to toss her oversized tote bag in into the back seat and slip through, hitting the lock button twice. The bag hits the car seat base. Most of the contents spill out on the floor. After starting the car and hitting the lock button again, Marnie rummages through the mess looking for her cell phone. She shoves pacifier, a pacifier, wet wipes, and a pack of gum back into her purse. She turns on the back seat light. After no luck, Marnie grabs her purse and dumps out the rest of the contents in the passenger seat. Nothing. Marnie catches a glimpse of a man wearing a dark coat with his hood up in her rearview mirror, walking towards her car. She shrinks in her seat. Please don't stop in my car. She glances back to see him walking past her car. That's right, just keep on walking, buddy. The white van roars to life, puffs of white smoke coming out of the exhaust from the cold. Great, creepy guy owns a creepy van. Marnie checks her pockets only to find the phone in the middle console of the car, dead. She plugs it into the car charger. Warm air starts to come out of the vents, so Marnie turns up the fan to heat the car faster and to defrost the front window. She glances at the white van still sitting there. What is he waiting for? She unpins her name tag from her black cotton shirt and places it in the middle console. She taps the cold steering wheel to a tune that had been stuck in her head all day. I'm a little teapot. Oh my gosh, this song is so annoying. Distract herself. Marnie turns on the radio. Tip me over and pour me. Stop. What's going on tomorrow? Pick up Katie from Tyler's in the morning. Crap. I'm in an exam in business law tomorrow. Hot date with the book tonight. She blew her bangs out of her eyes. I need a life. Marnie looks through the small opening that had been defrosted out onto the street down below. It had snowed earlier this morning, but already the beautiful white blanket was covered in dirt. Only a few cars were out driving, and all the stores across the street were closed. The phone lights up. She grabs the phone and finds six missed texts and three voicemails from her mom. Mom, Tyler never showed. I have to get to work, Marnie. I don't know what you saw in that boy. Katie is asleep. I have to go. Marnie Elizabeth. Marnie dials her voicemail, her mother's voice. Tyler never showed. I have to get to work and I can't take Katie with me. She's asleep and I locked the door. I gave the baby monitor to my new neighbor, Kevin. He's a sweetheart, really. He has the spare key, so if she wakes up. Marnie hits the off button, tosses a phone onto the passenger seat. He has a spare key. She puts the car in reverse, but slams on her brakes. The white van is blocking her in. She reaches her phone and dials. 911, what is your emergency? And the last thing I'll be reading is my nonfiction essay, The Other Side of the Glass. The loud thump on my window drew me to a sitting position in bed. The dogs barked and growled outside. I slid to the middle of the bed. My heart beat rapidly as I looked around the pitch black room. My bedroom was in the basement of our two-story house. I stared at the window, but the blinds were drawn shut. My sisters and I used to sneak out the window well. It was more exciting climbing up the red brick wall than using the back door. Once our adventures on the farm came to an end, we would hoist ourselves down the wall and climb back in the house through my window. It was less exciting now since frogs and salamanders seemed to find their way into the well. I stumbled out of bed, stubbing my toe as I headed to the window. Did one of you fall in? I pulled open the blinds. I pressed my face against the glass and tried to make out who it was. We had three dogs, two red healers who looked like large foxes, and the other part blue healer. 
I could just make out their shape. Which one of you morons fell in? I looked up, trying to determine which two dogs wasn't standing in my window well up in the rock garden. But all I could make out was the shape of the dogwood tree. The dogs kept barking. At this point, annoyed, I knocked on the glass and said, boys, to silence them. Could I just open my window and carry them out the back door? The screen's already off, so some mole clawed its way through. Then I'll have to change. My hand rested on the window crank, but I stopped. I shuffled my feet on the floor, moving dirty clothes out of my way as I went to turn on the light to try and see which one it was. I closed my eyes before the assault and slowly opened them. When my eyes adjusted, I looked at the window, but all I could see was my reflection. I left the door to my room open and walked up the steps to get my dad. He opened his bedroom door as I made it up the stairs. Did they wake you? He asked. Yes. One of them is in my window well. It's got to be rusty or speckles, though. It's too short to be Velcro. He looked out the kitchen window, down into my window well. Are you sure it's one of them? I counted three dogs up front. I thought so. It's got the same shape, I said. I pulled the scrunchie out of my hair to redo the messy bun so my hair didn't touch my neck. He went to the front door, walked outside, and called the dogs. They're all here. I followed him back down to my bedroom. He flipped on the light switch and walked up to the window, cupping his hands above his eyes. You have a coyote. How are you going to get out of there? I'm not going to worry about it now, Alex. Go back to bed. I'm not sleeping with a coyote in my window well. Then go sleep in another room, he said, and walked out. I grabbed my pillow and walked up the steps to another bedroom. I couldn't sleep, just tossed and turned. How would we get it out of there? Is it scared? Will it get in the house? I stared out the window at the backyard light as it flickered on and off. Eventually, sleep ensued, and I woke to the sound of a gunshot. I kept my eyes shut and laid there. Eventually, I got up and walked to the bathroom. I took a long shower and tried not to think about the wild animal that was now dead in my window well. When I got out of the shower, I went back down to my room for my cell phone and a book. I opened my door, standing to the side, as if I expected the coyote to jump out and attack me. I peeked inside. The coyote was lying down, curled up against the window. I had to walk by the window to get to my bookshelf and my phone, so I ran. I stopped near the window. Did it move? I stepped closer. Blood was splattered on my window. I waited to see if it would move, and I watched as its grayish-brown fur rose and fell. Its head was faced the other direction, but I could see its yellow eyes were open. His nose was tucked close to his body. He was beautiful. I could feel the tears fall from my lashes. Since my dad was likely at my grandparents or outside, I dialed my grandparents' phone number. They lived right across the gravel road. My dad answered. It's about time you woke up. It's still breathing. You have to help it. I'll be over in a little bit. You have to hurry. I stood by the window. I wanted to help him. He was just on the other side of the glass. I wanted to bring him in from the cold and wrap him in a blanket to pet his fur so he didn't have to be alone. I also wanted him gone, back into the woods. I was mad that the dogs had chased him here. It took my dad forever to make it back to our house. I saw the end of the gun. The coyote didn't even look up, but I closed my eyes and flinched at the gunshot. And that's what I have. <laughs> Now, I get to talk about a wonderful young lady, Kaylee Farley, whom I have had the best time with at Southwest Minnesota State University. She is a little crazy, a lot honest, hilarious, and is one of the kindest people I have had the privilege of calling a friend. She is from Maple Grove, Minnesota. She is the vice president of the English Club, the managing editor of Perceptions, and is a staff writer for The Spur. She started writing fan fiction about Pony Pals, where she changed the names to her friends when she was six years old. To this day, she continues to prefer to write fiction. We have taken multiple workshops and classes together. I have seen her work from the start of her career here and watched her grow as a writer and as a person. It is my pleasure to introduce you all to Kaylee Farley. Thank you, Alex. Um, I will be reading two pieces today. 
Um, one is a poem, and the other is a creative nonfiction piece. So I'll be starting with the poem. I, too, am an outsider after Langston Hughes. I am the lesser than, not golden daughter. They send me to eat hidden in my room while my brother is home. And I weep and eat poorly, but still grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be somewhere else, my place at the park, at a picnic table, writing my heart's truth. They won't dare say to me, eat in your room. Someday, maybe, they'll see how I carry myself and be surprised. I, too, am an outsider. Are you, too? And my second piece is a creative nonfiction piece titled Dancing with My Dragon, Depression. Carl casts a fireball, and as he does, he gets distracted by the Kraken for a second. Even so, that second was distraction enough to cause the ball to explode prematurely in his hands and face. Carl, your hair and hands are all burned, and your hands are blistered. You take seven points of damage and an additional two points of fire damage. This happened during a Dungeons and Dragons game that I was running with several of my friends over the summer. The wizard Carl was being played by my friend Mira, and she was attempting to battle a legendary sea monster. My friends and I were having too much fun for the earlier conversation of depression to have a factor in the game. Dungeons and Dragons is a role-playing game that typically takes place in some sort of fictional world. There are many published adventures that groups can go through, and if none of them catch interest, adventures can simply be made up according to what the group wants to do, such as focusing more on combat or role-playing. People playing D&D can also create their own terrain and creatures from out of foam and cardboard and other household materials. Dungeons and Dragons is a game that brings people together and is enjoyed by many. It was created by the late Gary Gygax in the late 1960s. He was frustrated with the rules and mechanics of the war games that he was playing at the time, so he decided to create his own. And we now know and love this as Dungeons and, Dungeons and Dragons. About seven years ago, in May of 2011, I was diagnosed with depression. I had not been in my right mind for most of my freshman year of high school, and one of my friends noticed that I wasn't acting like myself. She went to my high school counselor with a note that I'd written, which was a suicide note in all but name, and I was able to get the help that I needed. I was eventually able to get screened for and diagnosed with major depression. I hadn't been enjoying my usual activities like writing fiction or playing board games with my friends or even talking with my friends and teachers. I'm not sure if my teachers noticed my change in behavior, but if they did, they didn't say anything to me about it. I was always a quiet kid, but I became even quieter and more withdrawn over a matter of months. It was strange for a kid that was shy but usually friendly. 23% of females in high school are more likely to report seriously considering suicide versus 12% of males. However, males are more likely to succeed in their suicide attempts. According to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, or AFSP, the suicide rate in 2010 for those under the age of 20 was 2.8. And according to the National Institute for Mental Health, or NIM, the suicide rate per 100,000 for females in 2010 was 5.0. For males at the same time, the rate was 19.8. The total for per th 2010 per 100,000 is 12.1. I'd like to go attack the Kraken's eyes while it's distracted. Do I have to make a dis dexterity check or something since the tentacles are actively waving around, Mira asked. 
She pushed her shoulder-length black hair out of her green eyes that sparkled underneath artificial lights in my basement. Yeah, go right ahead. You'll be able to have advantage since on your roll since it was distracted by the cleric's ray of light. So go ahead, roll a 20-sided die twice and take the highest number. That's a seven? A seven, really? What's your modifier? I subtract one. And that was the best roll you got? That's great. So as you try to get at the Kraken's eyes, a tentacle slams into you. It knocks you off balance for a minute, but you still manage to make it to one of the eyes. What do you do? Mira leaned over the table, thinking. I don't know if any of my spells will work against this thing. Would I be able to cast Burning Hands and try to fry this eye out? You may certainly try. Roll to attack the Kraken. Later, when the session was over, another friend, John, who had been playing the party's cleric, asked me about how I was so happy. Whenever I see you, you're always smiling and trying to make other people laugh. How do you do it? I know that you were diagnosed with depression, but does that really have an effect on you? Like, you were on medication, and now you're not. So are you cured now or something? His brows furrowed over his serious hazel eyes. I laugh. You ever hear the phrase, fake it until you make it? That's what I do. Wait, let me get this straight. You're telling me that you weren't really diagnosed with depression? or that you aren't really happy a lot of the time. I was diagnosed, yes. That phrase has nothing to do with my depression. What I meant was, even when I'm not happy or feeling like I should be happy, I pretend to be. It makes other people kind of happy, right? And I found that if I just make myself smile and pretend to be happy, by the end of the day, I actually will be. At least happier than I was in the morning when I woke up. and. If I was able to make someone else smile today who needed it, then it was worth faking, wasn't it? But what about you? It's just lying to yourself as well to, as to other people. How can you live like that? He looked a bit disgusted with me. I've been living with it pretty well, I'd say. How do you live with yourself knowing that I was seriously struggling a few years ago before I was diagnosed and you didn't do anything to help me? A pause. That came out harsher than I meant it to, but you were my best friend at the time and you didn't notice that anything was wrong? I don't want to not believe you, but if my best friend doesn't notice that I'm acting differently but someone else does, does that really mean that we're as close as we want, we want to think? That being an, ended up being the last time that John and I talked. This was about two years ago now and I can't say that I've noticed much of a difference of how I've been living my life in terms of faking it till I make it. But I have found a better way to cope with my depression uh, on the days when it seems to be getting a stronger hold on me, Dungeons and Dragons. The creative process of creating new adventures and terrain alone has two thing properties to it. Energy can be focused on making something that multiple people would enjoy and help bring a new sense of realism to the game. People bond over, over the shared experience of fighting a mythical monster or talking to townspeople and having, honing their di diplomatic skills. And later on, they get to have a story that they get to tell others. With my depression, I have a hard time feeling like I belong in any sort of group because the feeling that I am somehow alienated from the greater group is still present. But with D&D, &D, I can focus the energy that I would otherwise be using to stress out about someone upsetting someone or trying to be a part of a group to make a creative and interactive experience that others can enjoy and bond over. Taking something that would otherwise be harmful and turning it into something that people can make friends over is an experience that I am glad to have enjoyed. In terms of D&D, &D, what is your depression like? I might be able to understand it better. Another friend, Lee, asked. 
His long, shoulder-length brown hair swayed as he shook his head to shoo a fly away. We were sitting in my, in my basement, going over the finished game and how they liked the encounter. Well, I'd say that it's like a black dragon, and its acid breath weapon just melts everything away until you can't recognize it anymore, and it's just this giant thing that you can't really defeat. But it's also like a... Mind flares are those things that mess up your brain, right? So it's like that too, because depression messes with your brain and makes you a different person. So like, a black dragon mind flayer. Man, that's really messed up, you know? Yeah, I know, I laugh. I decided to name it Steve. Now, while I have found an outlet in Dun Dungeons and Dragons, this isn't necessarily the hobby for everyone. You could try knitting or crocheting, volunteering at a local event or school, something that you're interested in but haven't necessarily tried before. It can help with putting your energy into something other than dwelling on your mental illness. The Kraken thrashes, its remaining limbs working through the water as though its intent was to emulate the rough storm happening around you. Its death throws slow, then ultimately still as the last remaining life in its body is stolen from it by Carl's spell. The body sinks below the waves as the air is expelled from its air sacs. As the immediate danger passes from view, you are able to take stock of what exactly happened in, in the madness of the Kraken attack. There are the bodies of your party members strewn about the deck, as well as the bodies of the sailors that got caught in the action. Out of their original 15 sailors that accompanied you, eight are dead. Three of your five party members are dead. What happens now is up to you. And, I smile, looking at each of my party members' faces. They hung on my words, waiting for whatever trouble or adventure I'd bring them next. That is well, where we'll end for tonight. Good, great job, everyone. So I get to introduce Brittany Branch next. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with her over the past four years here at SMSU. She is a creative writing major. I've gone from being slightly intimidated by this tall, quiet young woman to being heartbroken by her Harry Potter jokes and calling her my friend. I've enjoyed her writing from one of her nonfiction pieces about being a mascot to another one about flying at a church camp. Please welcome Brittany Branch. Thanks, Kaylee. All right, so I'll be reading two pieces. Uh, one is a fiction piece, actually a little short blurb from a uh, book slash book series I've been working on since seventh grade, and then the other one is a poem that I wrote a month or so ago. But yeah. The uh, book is titled Do or Wildcats Don't Cry, and starting with the prologue. Mark, come on. We promised we'd take Toby for a walk. Mark's twin sister, Becky, yelled into the basement. Hold on, I'm almost done with this level of cod, Mark hollered back. No, now it's getting dark. Becky showed up out of nowhere, snatching up the controller and saving the game for Mark. Come on, we have a little more than an hour before Mom and Dad get home. We might as well make it seem like we've been hanging outside for most of the time. She handed Mark the poop bags as they walked upstairs where their black cocker spaniel, Toby, was waiting, already hooked up to his leash, holding it playfully in his mouth. Drop, good boy. Becky picked up the leash and they left through the back door. They had been walking around the lake for almost 20 minutes as the trail they had been following led them up a hill to, back to the main road, the twins spotted a black Ford. Toby started growling and barking. Two men exited the vehicle wearing a, the same suit and masks, each mask having scratch marks on the face and a paw print logo on the chest of the suit. Becky froze. 
Mark pried the leash from her hands and let Toby loose to take care of them as Mark and Becky turned to run. But instead of running at the guys and attacking, Toby bolted past the twins and out of sight. Mark tugged at Becky's hand to keep running, but she stopped and looked back. At that same moment, a current of shock waves ran through Mark's body. Mark cried out and heard Becky scream too. <laughs> then everything went black. Mark woke up on a table. Looking to his right, he saw Becky lying limp on the next table. Sitting upright, right, he rushed over to her, checking for a pulse that was just barely there. Mark looked around the room and saw the mirror. What have you done? He yelled, storming up to the glass. All of a sudden, Mark felt this weird tingling in his arm. Looking down, he watched his arm and hand transform into a gray leg and paw. Welcome to the, to the WDCSS team, Mark. Two years later. Great. Tryouts for basketball are tomorrow, and I haven't picked up a ball since Wednesday. I mumbled to myself. Truth be told, Wednesday's shooting was terrible. Reason? Well, the backboard on the hoop is broken, so the bars that support it send the ball anywhere besides in the hoop. Maybe I'll shoot some hoops at the YMCA. My name is Kate Bush. I participate in traveling basketball, and I'm in eighth grade. Because my last name is Bush, a girl who was on my first traveling basketball team in fifth grade called me Blueberry Bush. That name used to bug me, but I got used to it, and now she's the only one who calls me that. Hey Kate, are you excited for this season of cross country? Just asked as she ca caught up with me in the hall. Oh yeah, I mean it's our second year, but I'm not really worried about it. I smiled as we entered the locker room and just went to her row. See you in the cafeteria. After I finished changing, I went to the cafeteria and looked for Jess. The cafeteria at Dakota Hills Middle School is pretty big. Normally, there are multiple rows of lunch tables taking up the whole space. But once the eighth graders have had their lunch, the tables are folded up and put along the wall near the cafeteria entrance. The back wall was floor to ceiling windows with doors on each end of it. There were also four pillars that helped support the ceiling and a staircase along the far wall that leads to the horseshoe entrance of the school where everyone gets dropped off. The place had about 30 kids in it. Some were seventh graders and others were eighth. Within a matter of minutes, I spotted Jess over by one of the pillars. So you're going to a football game tonight? She asked as she started stretching. Um, I don't know. I mean, I have tryouts in the morning, so I'll probably go to the YMCA and practice shooting for a while. I paused thinking of what else I have going on tonight. Crap, I have a ton of homework to do too, so I don't even know if I'll make it to the Y. All right, everybody, let's do our warm-up run, and then we'll run the Dakota Hills course, yelled Coach Tim. Everyone jogged out the doors and started a slow sprint towards the woods. We followed the worn-down deer trail and running path. Within a few minutes, we were out of the woods and in the clearing headed back to DHMS. Before we ran the actual cross-country meet trail, we took five minutes water break and slowly started to run to where the trail began. After about an hour, we were done and practice was over. When I got home, I ran upstairs, shutting my door and started my homework. Halfway through my math assignment, my mom called my name. Katie, dinner, she called from downstairs. What? I opened the door so I could hear better. I looked down the steps. The hamburgers are done. Now wash your hands and come down for dinner. Okay, be right down. I went into the bathroom and washed my hands and headed down to the dining room. I sat by my bro younger brother and older sister as my mom served us dinner. May I go to the Y after supper to pra practice basketball? I squirted ketchup on my burger and passed it to my brother. Is your homework done? She set the, glass on the, the glasses on the table and took a seat. No. I muttered, looking back down at my food. Then no, school comes first. <laughs> Can me and Lily go to the football game, Mom? My little brother Joe asked before taking a bite of his burger. Is your homework done? My mom asked, taking a sip of milk. Yes, Lily answered for my brother while he finished chewing and nodded his head. Okay, sure, we'll leave after dinner. 
Kate, will you be fine on your own? She asked as I dolefully nodded my head, taking another bite of my burger. When dinner was finished, I cleaned up the dishes and I cleaned up the dishes. Before leaving, my mom came over and gave me a kiss goodbye on the cheek and left with my brother and my sister. I let the dogs out and head upstairs to finish my math assignment. When I hear the dogs bark, I finish I answer the last question before returning downstairs to let them back in. Within an hour, I was finished with my homework. Once my assignments were packed back, back into my bag, I went for a walk, leaving the dogs behind. It was chilly out, but I didn't really mind. The stars were out, and the moon, screech. A black Ford pulled up, and two people jumped out. They were wearing the same suit full head mask that had scratch marks on the face, and there was a paw print on the chest of each suit. Grabbed by the wrists and shoulders, I was shoved into the car, and we sped off. The windows were so tinted, I couldn't tell where we were going. Who are you? My family is going to be home soon, I exclaimed, trying not to sound nervous or scared. We'll have you back in time before they'll even know you were gone, answered one of them. Before I could ask another question, everything went black. I didn't know how long I'd been out for, but when I awoke, I was laying on a stainless steel table. On the table next to me was another girl from Traveling Basketball, whom I recognized to be Christy. She was still and somewhat motionless. I sat up, rubbing my head, looking back at Christy. I saw her eyebrows furrow before she opened her eyes and turned to look at me. She sat up in shock, almost falling off her table. Christy was in my grade. She had brown hair that was shoulder length and green eyes. We both played traveling basketball, but I had never been on a team with her. What the heck is going on, and why are you here? She yelled before looking around the room, realizing she wasn't at home. Where the hell are we? Uh, I was going to ask you the same thing. I whispered, taking a look around the room myself. It wasn't very big. There were just the two tables, some cabinets, and some extremely large lamps like the ones you would see in a doctor's emergency room. On the wall in front of us, though, was just this random mirror that was the width of the wall itself. On the next wall, there was a door. Before either of us could get up to leave, it opened, and in stepped a guy who was still wearing his suit, but no mask. Hello, ladies. Hope you slept well. A smile came across his face. My name is John. Sorry if my friend and I were a little rough getting you into the car earlier. He had soft eyes as blue as the ocean, tall, with broad shoulders, well-built, and bald. He almost looked like the rock. Okay, well that still doesn't explain where we are or why we're even here, Christy sneered, glaring at John as he walked over and stood in front of our tables. My apologies. You have been recruited as agents for what is known as the WDCSS, also known as Wildcats Don't Cry Secret Service. It's one of many organizations around the U.S. that helps protect the cities and high schools of every state. Each city has a different name for their secret service depending on the high school mascot. He paused to think for a moment. The secret service programs have about, mm, I want to say maybe seven to ten teenagers starting in eighth grade all the way to twelfth grade. Four out of the seven or ten agents are... John paused again, his hand moving up to scratch his hairless scalp. How do I put it? Well, their bodies are altered. He looked at both of us to see if we would say anything. In other words, your DNA has been tampered with, so you have the ability to transform into a wildcat. Are you freaking kidding me? A, that can't be true or even possible. And B, there's no way we could be recruited as agents for some secret service team. It's not like we're the new Cody Banks or anything. Christy was tensing up, and I could tell. But the weird thing was, I also noticed that her arms were starting to grow short, thick gray hairs. Um, Christy, have you checked your arm? I pointed at her arm, which was halfway covered. What the? See, like I said, you and Kate have both, both have the ability to transform. Kate, I bet if you think about it, you can transform too. John turned to me as he leaned back against the mirror. Really, he wanted me to think about this? I mean, honestly, it's way too much. The organization, the transforming, I could barely wrap my head around the whole idea. 
Before I knew it, I felt my jaw jerk out an inch or two. Licking my teeth, I found them to be somewhat sharper as far as canines go. My ears were no longer on either side of my head, but on top, and they were pointed. My arms and legs seemed to somehow shorten themselves. My hands had become paws, and kicking off my shoes and socks saw that my feet were now paws too. Sitting on the table felt weird, and there was an odd and really uncomfortable bump in the back of my shorts. Awkwardly reaching in, I felt my tail. I pulled it out or over the back of my shorts as I turned my head to find it was about four or so feet long, and the tip was a cream color. Fully transformed, it was a struggle to stand on my now hind legs. I looked towards Christy, who was examining herself in the mirror. Taking a look, at, taking a look as well, John moved off to the side to give me room. It was weird. My once long brown hair had somehow disappeared. My head was gray with fur, eyes still blue, but there was no white around the irises. My nose was at the end of my snout, and I could see the top of it. Looking in the mirror to watch my nostrils flare. Of course, going onto all fours made it easier to walk, and just as I hit the ground on my front paws, my clothes seemed to vanish. All right. And then, next piece I'm reading is a poem. It's called Unmasked Mascot. Give me a two-piece suit, an extremely large head, and a game or event to attend. I can't talk. A buff, lo mm. a buff looking Mustang with a social personality and a good sense of humor. I can't talk. I'm not that social. Depends on where I am, also who I'm with. I can't talk. You ask who it is, don't care when you find out. Gloat and say that you know. I can't talk. Small children are cute, but can be aggressive. I'm a walking pinata. I can't talk. He's one thing, a Mustang. I'm human and female, two separate characters. Stanger can't talk. He's happy, he's happy and energetic, but I have anxiety and depression. Though our humor matches up, Stanger can't talk. Most don't understand, even when I explain, we're far from the same. Stanger can't talk. I can talk, and write too. The stories of you and ones of him. Stanger can't talk. I still have a voice. Off duty I will answer if you ask. Cause I'm the mascot and Stanger can't talk. That's it. Once again, thank you to Brittany, Kaylee, and Alexandra for their outstanding readings, and thank you all for being here today. Please enjoy the rest of the conference.